During her 31-year career, Queen Mary has battled fierce North Atlantic storms and the perils of war service. Even in her California retirement, she survived past mismanagement, neglect, and the occasional atmospheric river. Somehow she always manages to persevere, and lately, for the first time in years, her future looks brighter than ever. So please join me for what is now my third update on all the progress that's being made. Follow me aboard as I check in as a hotel guest for a weekend stay on this legendary liner. We'll enter at the A-Deck Lobby, which was originally the First Class Purser's reception area. While this nice gentleman checks me in, let's have a look around. Aside from the carpeting and black marble, the central part of this foyer is much as it always has been, with etched glass lighting and polished veneers of ash burr, elm, mazur birch, and chestnut. A series of nickel bronze clocks above the desk provide somewhat skewed times in five key cities. On the starboard side, the lobby bar occupies space once delegated to a doctor's office and the staff purser. Spectacular marquetry panels transferred from other areas of the ship and original lighting help integrate the space. There are intimate seating nooks, some with views of the Long Beach skyline, through the now glass shell doors. And just inboard of the bar, there's another nook that was carved out of the mail and parcel office. If you're lucky during your visit, the grand piano will be tickled by local maestro Scott McDonald, who's been a cherished Queen Mary fixture for decades. All right, now it's time to head to our deluxe original cabin, A101, which is just a few steps away. This was originally the sitting room portion of suite A51 and an interior cabin, A49. In the former sitting room, there are now two twin beds with a pair of portholes facing Long Beach. What we see here is just a portion of the stateroom, which extends inboard through its former bathroom to a second bedroom, which was originally cabin A49. And just around that bend to the right is the loo. Now that we're settled, let's have a look at some other cabins. Located on starboard main deck, the Queen Mary Suite is a sumptuous space with a large living room that makes it ideal for parties. The room has two large portholes and is festooned with what I'm pretty sure is glowing Maser birch paneling. Within moments of our visit, a party was held in this space, hence the lack of furnishings. The bedroom also has two large portholes and is paneled in bird's eye maple, featuring a trio of carvings and beautifully crafted cabinetry. This sumptuous suite was originally parts of three suites and staterooms, M71, M73, and M75. Former First Class Cabin A155, originally A115, is a deluxe with a twin bed setup. Like most of the Queen Mary's outside staterooms, the portholes can open up. The bathroom still has its tub and original taps, but the days of saltwater baths have long since passed. B447, originally tourist class, which was later called cabin class B103, has a king setup and is an interesting combination of old and new, with some original cabinetry, but with wallpaper in lieu of wood paneling. 
It too has original but non-functioning taps. B455, originally tourist than cabin class B115, is a little smaller but has gorgeous paneling and an etched glass mirror topped with a deco fan. Thus far, about 200 hotel rooms are open, with another 100 or so to come online soon. B457 was originally B117 and has twin beds as well as a lovely seating nook under the portholes. The deco fans remind me of Elsa Lanchester's hair streak in The Bride of Frankenstein. That's a good thing. And nothing beats those Bakelite Punkalovers, remnants from the pre-air conditioning era. So now let's head to the former tourist, then cabin class lounge, the Britannia Salon, for the quarterly meeting of the Southern California chapter of the Steamship Historical Society of America. Four meetings aboard the Queen Mary are included in the annual $20 membership fee, and February's guest speaker was Tom Varney, who flew in from Anchorage to tell the story of his magnificent eight-foot models of Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth. Um, I'm here today uh, to discuss a crazy hobby of mine that got out of hand. 56 years later, Mary and Elizabeth, sisters of the sea, once the most celebrated vessels on the water, are now passing again, albeit in miniature form. <laughs> Tom's masterpieces arrived in January and are now on display near the engine room entrance on D-Deck. They're especially spectacular in person, where their scale and detailing can be fully appreciated. It was such a nice bonus to have Tom tell us about these two new reasons to pay the Mary a visit. I'm with Tom Varney, who has come down from Anchorage, Alaska, with these two incredibly beautiful, finely detailed models that he spent 25 years creating of Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary. So Tom, tell me about this. What, there's something about Mary, but I think there's really something about Tom that he would do something like this. Well, it helps being the weird kid. And um, I've always been fascinated with ocean liners, especially Queen Mary. And it was just um, a casual suggestion from a former roommate to make a really big model of Queen Mary that would have never have crossed my mind in a million years. <laughs> but once the idea is planted, you know how that goes. And so it took me 20 years to complete Mary. I was not in a hurry. This was back in the infancy years of the internet. So I was up in Anchorage, Alaska, kind of all by myself, trying to figure out how to build this thing and to really do her justice, if, you know, to not have too many mistakes. And like I said, I wasn't in a hurry. It was always a project that was waiting on the, um, on the workbench whenever I wanted to, to work on it. Yeah. And then in the early 2000s, I started making pilgrimage trips down here. And I know I must have looked really weird um, with my 35 millimeter camera taking a picture, taking a picture, taking a picture, and then um, get all the photos developed. There was no digital photography back then and then just taping them together in long strips and putting an X on pieces that Long Beach put on, like roof air conditioners and mm -hmm. making little sketches and notes and things that have been removed but I needed to put on. And that's kind of how I um, worked my way through this. So, question on, you were talking about drafting. Do you have an architectural, yes. do you have a background in architecture? I have a, a background in architectural drafting. Right. And th I started out as a board drafter, but then through the years, it became a computer. So um, I learned AutoCAD when I moved to Anchorage, Alaska. I was able to scan 
plans from books and various sources into AutoCAD, scale the plans and the drawings to the scale of the model, yeah. and then print large paper drawings so I'd have paper patterns of everything I needed to do model size. That's incredible. I think that helped a lot it with did. your background. It did. So when I finished Queen Mary, then I thought, well, what's next? Well, obviously it was Queen Elizabeth, and I have to admit I knew nothing about her. So it was a big voyage of discovery to learn about her and luckily I, I found um, a source of incredible drawings from an old board drafter like me and that was his labor of love to leave the definitive record of Queen Elizabeth. With those drawings I was able to put those into AutoCAD and manipulate um, different things and then use the, the new technology that had come over the 20 years of uh, basically kind of creating my own kit with Queen Elizabeth uh, in the form of laser cutting parts and pieces. So all of the portals in Elizabeth are nice and crisp. Yeah. Things are kind of rough on, on Mary because it was all stabs with an X-Acto knife yeah. and, and a little bit of my DNA as I would cut myself. How old were you when you fell in love with the Mary and how did you discover her? Well, I was one of those weird kids that read the newspaper every morning for breakfast. And I would follow um, Queen Mary's retirement in the paper. And I, honestly, in landlocked Ohio, I'm not sure how I fell in love with ocean liners, though I think it was the small town library on rainy Saturday afternoons thumbing through picture books mm -hmm. and just marveling at these pieces of technology. And then I was like, oh gosh, Queen Mary's retiring and follow through that and then, oh, she's in a movie, Poseidon Adventure. Mm -hmm. So the inspiration for my model and the fact that it lights up was the Poseidon model from the movie mm -hmm. because it was all aglow and I was like, this is just, this is the look I want to have. So, so it's just the Cunarders that you love. You didn't love French line and... Normandy, um, Normandy was always in the back of my mind because mm -hmm. She's just so darn sexy. Yeah. And then later on, yes, the uh, SS United States came into my focus. I've pretty much read anything I can about the ship. And everybody asked me, what's your next big project? <laughs> so I, I've got my sights on SS United States. It was quite a, a harrowing experience. I'm a control freak. So for 27 years, I had total control over what happened to these models. Yeah. When you pass that off to a shipping company, you've lost that control. Oh, yeah. And a lot of different factors. So it wasn't until the models were wheeled down here and we peeled back the paper on the plexiglass, would we have models or would we have plexiglass filled with toothpicks? <laughs> we just didn't know. Yeah. And so... Whew. When you were building these, did you have any idea that they would actually come to live on the Queen Mary at some point? And what does it feel like to actually be on the Queen Mary with these two beautiful creations of yours? You know, in the back of my mind, it was always a fantasy, especially as I started making more and more, I call them pilgrimage trips down to the ship and to see what models they had, to see what they didn't have. And what they certainly didn't have was Elizabeth. And I thought, if I could bring her back to life, then there would be a match set that very few mu museums in the world would have. But yeah, I'm, I'm a proud papa. I don't have any kids or anything. These ships are my legacy. And they're right where I want them to be. I was talking to my friend Joe Murray right after they were installed. And a little kid went up and put their face up there. And she's like, Tom, what do you think's happening there? And I went, what a great question. Because you just wonder what's inside that child's mind. And I said, well, Joe, I think we're probably planting seeds. And uh, kids love models because it's something on their scale. Yeah. And, uh, and I was always been fascinated with models and things like that. So um, I grew up to do this. How much do each of these weigh? The entire case, as you see it here, is about 450 pounds. And then when they were in the wooden crates, they were 1,200 pounds. Oh my God, each 1,200 pounds in the wooden crates? Yeah, because the crates were built by an Alaskan company 
and we just build things tough up there. Okay. You know, it was expensive, but man, this was the result. Yeah. And I had a wonderful cabinet maker in Anchorage that built the bases. He was into it. And uh, in fact, he left one of the ends off so he could crawl on his back inside to mount these up through the bottom. That way there's no visible means of fastening. Sure, of course. He That's was into it from the very beginning. I said, this is what we're going to do, Tom. So I was up above trying to hold everything together <laughs> yeah. because the models used to come apart in two pieces. And so we put them together and drilled pilot holes. He was underneath, screw, screw, and I'm just like, oh God, oh God, oh God. Yeah. But no, he took it just very gently. And uh, his name's Leon, hats off to Leon. Hats he made this happen. Leon. It's great to have somebody like Leon on your team who understands and appreciates everything. Oh, from day done. one, he was excited. Yeah. He goes, yeah, I want this project. Yeah. And uh, okay. And the fun part were, were the brass school bells. Yeah. I love that. And that they was just a total place. accident yeah. Yeah. to find something to mount these guys on and still have a nautical look. Yeah, I've not seen guys. anybody else yeah. do it. Yeah. Well, now you will. Well, I like your nameplate, but I think you need your name in neon or, or above this whole thing. I think you just well, need people to fully understand 25 I, years of your life went into these two things. And, and I decided to dedicate them both to my parents. Oh, cool. Mary is... Um, devoted to my mom and um, my dad got Queen Elizabeth and they, they're both gone now but at the very bottom of each plaque I put a little kind of thank you for letting me be the weird kid <laughs> I was the weird kid growing up I wasn't athletically inclined I was you know I was the artistic geek and I sit in my room and build models and draw pictures and the rest of my family were playing four-handed card games Right. I, to this day, I can't shuffle a deck of cards. <laughs> but they just let me do it. They yeah. didn't pressure me. You need to play football. You've got to have a basketball in your hand like so many of my friends sure. in my small hometown. Yeah. They just said, hey, that's cool. That's neat. Because they kind of realized, there aren't any other kids that can do this. Yeah. And they just encouraged me. Yeah, and I said, all right, well. And they were always fascinated with Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth, and we've had relatives sail on them through the generations, and, and I said, okay, I'm going to put their names on Queen Mary. Thank you, my friend. It's an honor to be here with you in front of these gorgeous creations. Thank you. Thank you for everything you've done to preserve their history and to give a gift to new generations of people who will hopefully come to love ocean liners so that they can be as popular well, as they once were. There are plans underway to enhance all of this around here. Yeah. to make these the centerpiece of whatever they're going to do down there. Cool. So Elizabeth will be front and center. Great. And I can't be happier. Yeah. And now let's head topside for more progress. This is not a Photoshop black and white image, but rather funnel number three in its gray primer as a much needed new coat of red paint is being applied. By the time you see this, that base will be all red. The lifeboat davits on sun deck are freshly painted and the teak decking continues to improve with each visit. I love crossing sun deck via the narrow athwart ship's alleyways over the expansion joints. Queen Mary was fitted with three of these joints to alleviate stress on her superstructure during rough crossings. The forward portion of sun deck has been closed off for refurbishment, but the aft areas and even the temporary ply on the port side have been nicely cleaned up. Even the tiered extension on aft sun deck that is often used for weddings and private events has been freshened up. This is actually the top of the dome above the center portion of the Britannia Lounge. Here's a Saturday afternoon view with carnival panorama lurking beyond promenade deck. And this is the corresponding view from aft promenade deck.
And before we head back inside, here's a look over the fantail. Since our last update, a new candy shop called the Piccadilly Delights has opened up in the portside main hall kiosk. Much farther aft, I was able to visit the Royal Wedding Chapel, which was originally the port side of the tourist, then later cabin class smoking room. Including these stunning etched doors, the decor in this space was originally executed by Messrs. Maple and Company of London. Today, there's a lobby and dressing areas near the chapel entrance, which features two original light fixtures. Beyond another pair of original doors with nickel bronze insets is the chapel itself. Pew-style seating now fills the space that is surrounded in brown curly oak and Indian gold paduk paneling with pilasters encased in walnut. And hovering overhead are original nickel bronze framed light fixtures. On the guided haunted encounters and paranormal shipwalk tours, guests can now access an observation platform on the port side of the first class pool, a space that is often considered by many to be a hot spot of paranormal activity. While it's unlikely the pool will be fully restored for guest use, there has been some discussion about possible cosmetic repairs to at least make it look like it did in its prime. I'm so happy to be able to feature Queen Mary's grandest space, the soaring former cabin and first class restaurant, now called the Grand Lounge. So let's enter via the port side gallery, past bulkheads adorned in Brazilian paroba wood and heavy brass portholes that once faced surging seas. Here we see a space that was among the finest and most opulent across the Atlantic, set up for the gala Sunday brunch. The center dome soars to a height of 27 feet with a pair of 17-foot intermediate recesses on either side. That a space like this still functions, let alone exists today, is nothing short of miraculous. I can't think of any shipboard art panel as important and revered as MacDonald Gill's decorative map of the Atlantic that rests on the forward bulkhead. Tracing the route from Nantucket to Bishop's Rock are a pair of tracks with illuminated Baccarat crystal representations of the Queens Elizabeth and Mary. On the New York side, there's the Aquitania and Queen Elizabeth. The latter was added after World War II, while the Mary is portrayed under the London skyline. Not to be outdone, the aft portion of this room is dominated by Philip Connard's spectacular tapestry-style painting of English country life. And just below the glorious bronze doors leading to the galley were the creation of father and son, Walter and Donald Gilbert. From there, here's a forward-facing view of this legendary space. On the inner port side, there's a painting on silver leaf of American birds by A. Duncan Carse, who also painted the English birds panel on the starboard side. Fourteen carved wood panels by Bainbridge Copnell line the dome's outer flanks, depicting the art of shipbuilding through the ages. This one, depicting Great Eastern, Mauritania, and Queen Mary is my personal favorite, but they're all outstanding.
illuminating the border of the central dome are frosted glass medallions by Walter and Donald Gilbert, who also executed the bronze doors leading to the galley. Stunning etched glass lighting adorns the dome's outer soffits, and even the nickel bronze grills are works of art. Kudos to Queen Mary's original design team of Arthur J. Davis and Benjamin Morris for creating this legendary space. Also not to be missed are the swoon-worthy silvered glass panels depicting Jason and the Golden Fleece that line the room's port and starboard galleries. And finally, hovering over the Grand Salon's less traveled starboard entrance, is one of many stunning light fixtures. The adjoining Windsor Salon is a Long Beach addition that was carved out of parts of the forward portion of the restaurant and the second funnel hatch. The Windsor has a deco-inspired frosted glass ceiling and is shown here with food stations set up for the Sunday brunch. While the ambiance in the Windsor is mostly contemporary, if you look closely, there's that glorious Paroba wood paneling, several of those Jason and the Golden Fleece panels, and frosted mirrors with vintage cachet. Well, now that you've seen the setup, why not join me for the actual brunch, a time-honored Sunday tradition that returned to the Mary Thank late you. last year. See you. <laughs> Excellent. We chose table 42 directly under the dome, but every seat in this opulent space is a good one. And the wait staff are very generous with the champagne, mimosas, fresh squeezed OJ, and coffee. An added bonus was having Long Beach Mayor Rex Richardson and his wife Nina at the adjacent table. How nice to have the Mary being appreciated by those who run the city she helped put on the map. And now let's have a look at the spread lined up in the Windsor Salon. We can start with the fresh baked pastries, then head to the Italian with roasted veggies and a Caesar salad bar. There's a Mexican station nearby. And loads of seafood, as well as fresh fruit. You can order custom omelets here. This is where you get artfully crafted sushi and Asian food 
Hakes Benedict and other breakfast courses are here. Various hot courses complement a carvery. And this is the bacon and sausage stop. And the desserts include freshly made waffles and an assortment of petit feu and other confections. Just listen to the buzz in the busy observation bar. One of my favorite things about being a hotel guest is being able to walk Queen Mary's decks at night. And even better in the rain, which makes it easier to beam oneself back in time and imagine what it was like to cross in this engineering marvel. Well, I hope you enjoyed this Queen Mary update. I'm going to wrap it up here, right where we started. Until next time, bon voyage. Mm -hmm.